When you think of Mercedes in Formula One, you think of a team that won eight world championships in a row. But I've recently learned of one key mistake that caused all of that success to end in 2022. And I spoke with an ex F1 aerodynamicist to understand exactly what went wrong. Mercedes arrived at testing in Bahrain in 2022 with an unusual design, the zero pod concept, but the results weren't as they'd hoped. And this poor performance lasted until more recently, where, as we know, they're now in the hunt for at least a podium most weekends. So what caused this two-year blip? Well, it's absolutely fascinating, and it all starts in their wind tunnel. So to fully understand what happened to Mercedes, first we have to understand what a wind tunnel does and why they're so important. Just the wind tunnel costs between five and $10 million a year to run. But of course, F1 relies so heavily on aero that this is well worth it. And to understand how wind tunnels work and how they impacted Mercedes form, I talked to Willem Toet, former head of aerodynamics at Benetton, Ferrari and Sauber. Well, one thing special is you're only allowed 40 runs average per week. That's not many runs. But what's special about a wind tunnel is you can do a mini Grand Prix simulation. The aerodynamic forces at play during a race are very complex to say the least, but engineers can get a good understanding with just a few wind tunnel runs. First, a run without any wind, just to measure the mechanical forces on the car going through the tires, and then another run with the wind turned on. And the difference between these two values is what the engineers are looking for when they're developing the car. They're just trying to add more grip. So how does a wind tunnel actually work? Well, before we get into that, I'd like to introduce you to today's sponsor, Shopify. Shopify is a commerce platform that allows you to start, grow and manage a business. We used it for our F1 carbon wallet. And we're selling internationally, so the Managed Markets feature allowed us to do that whilst also selling in local currencies, all at the click of a button. You can also divide shipping costs and lead time into numerous regions quickly and easily, which gives customers the information they need right at the checkout. So whether you're working on a passion project, a new product, or a small business you've been thinking about, there's never been a better time to start. With Shopify, you have all the tools you need to turn your idea into a thriving business. Setting up our site for the F1 Carbon Wallet was really quick and easy. Everything just worked out of the box and it looks great. By the way, we'll be launching another one soon. And the best part of Shopify is that it's built for entrepreneurs at every stage. So whether you're just starting out or looking to take your business to the next level, Shopify's got your back. You can start your free trial today at shopify.com forward slash driver61. That's shopify.com forward slash driver61. Now, back to the video. Well, F1 teams work with a closed loop wind tunnel, which means that the air circulates around a completely closed loop of a tunnel thanks to a big fan. The fan is located in what's called the drive section of the tunnel. And the bigger the fan is, the slower it needs to rotate for the airflow to be at the right speed. It's also important to make sure that the airflow is smooth because once it gets to the car, lumpy airflow can interfere with the accuracy of the data the wind tunnel produces. This is why the entire design of the wind tunnel is made to slow down and then speed up the airflow in a controlled way. So after the air is accelerated by the fans in the drive section, it passes through a diffuser, a wider section of the tunnel, to slow the air down a little bit and keep the flow steady and smooth. Once the flow reaches a corner of the tunnel, it passes through turning vanes, which have the job of directing the flow as it turns, again to avoid as much turbulence as possible. Then right before getting to the F1 model, the flow passes through a settling chamber. And here, more than ever, it's important to get the airflow as steady as possible and at the perfect speed. That's why this chamber is even wider and has lots of vanes and other structures that look like honeycomb to really control the flow. And as the air settles down, the chamber then starts to get gradually smaller, forcing the air to pick up speed again up to the 120 miles an hour that the FIA allows. This high speed air then reaches the testing area where the model car is placed over a rolling road. And the rolling roads are awesome. It's kind of like a conveyor belt that can run up to 185 miles per hour. To keep the model car in place and control its movements, there's usually a long set of vertical arms and 
depending on the facility, some horizontal arms. And the tires and wheels are free to move too. So when the rolling road gets going, the car can quite well simulate turning, just like on track. The car itself is also able to simulate roll, pitch and yaw because the engineers need to see how that affects the car's aerodynamics. Not only that, but they can choose to control each wheel individually to have more control over the simulation. So when we were allowed rear wheel steering, the rear wheels would be steered in the model and the front wheels as well. But it's easier to just have a separate mechanism for each wheel and then you can do what you like. Once the rolling road is on and the air starts to flow, this is where the testing begins. And there'll be tons of sensors around the key areas of the car to understand how much downforce they're creating. But it's also important to visualize how the airflow behaves around the car. And there are several ways to do this, like particle image velocimetry, which is a fancy way to see air moving around the car. Engineers release tiny particles into the wind tunnel's airflow. Then they use special cameras and lasers to track how these particles move around the car. It's kind of like taking a series of snapshots of the air's motion. This technique lets the team actually see the airflow patterns. They can spot things like vortices and areas of turbulence that might not show up in other tests. And it's incredibly useful for understanding exactly how air behaves around different parts of the car, helping engineers fine tune the aerodynamics. By the way, if you're into aerodynamics or any role within a motorsport company, check out fluidjobs.com where we list the very best motorsport jobs. You can set up job alerts and add your professional profile. Or if you're not quite ready to do that, you can take our scorecard and get actionable advice on how to best prepare for a career in motorsport. To sport. And the links for that are below. Now, understanding the airflow in itself is important, mainly because of something called the boundary layer. When air flows over a car, it doesn't just glide smoothly across the surface. It's way more complex than that. Right on the car's surface, some air molecules will actually stick to it. And we call this the no-slip condition. These molecules have zero velocity relative to the car. They're basically along for the ride. But as you move away from the surface, things change. The air gradually speeds up until it reaches what we call the free stream velocity. And this is the air that's flowing at full speed, mostly unaffected by the car's surface. So what happens between the no slip and the free stream velocity sections? Well, you have a small area of transition where the air molecules pass in layers and collide with each other and slowing down in the process, starting at very slow velocity closest to the no slip layer. However, as the layers build, the molecules start slowing themselves down less and less until the effect is practically nothing, until finally we get to the free stream velocity. And please bear with me, this is really important to understanding why Mercedes had those struggles a few years ago. This whole area of transition is the boundary layer, and it's important to understand it because just like any type of flow, it can behave in two ways either in a steady way, organized in layers with very little mixing between them, which is called laminar flow, or in a disorganized chaotic way with a lot of mixing as the layers are barely a thing anymore. This is called turbulent flow. The air starts by, we call it laminar flow, early on in the, in the growth of a boundary layer if you have a smooth surface. Um, and then it grows more quickly. Once you start getting this local, let's say this local rolling you'll get near, near the surface, those molecules bounce up and interact with others and then the turbulence becomes a, a little greater. Now, one of the goals for F1 engineers is to be able to identify which parts of the car are likely to create turbulent flow. Because the more turbulent the flow is, the less predictable it is. And that is a pain for aerodynamicists. And this boundary layer was a huge headache for all the teams and Mercedes in particular when the regulations changed in 2022 and the cars with ground effect were introduced. And it all starts with how changes in ride height could significantly affect the car's performance. Let's say you start at low speed with everything high in the ground. As you reduce the ride height, performance will get better and better and better and you'll follow like a curve where each step of ride height gives you a, an ever bigger and bigger and bigger step of performance improvement. But as you approach the limit, you, you reach a sort of a plateau. This happens because of the Bernoulli principle. It's a basic rule in fluid dynamics that says when air speeds up, the pressure drops. And the opposite is also true. Slower air has a higher pressure. 
To translate this from physics speak to English, in practice, when the airflow passes through a smaller passage, like the space between an F1 car's floor and the track, it speeds up. And this means that there's then less pressure under the car. So it gets sucked down, adding downforce, pulling the tires into the track harder and allowing the driver to brake, turn and accelerate a bit faster. Now there is a limit to how much you can lower your ride height. And there is a sweet spot where the car reaches peak performance. And at peak performance, the airflow partially separates from the car. The boundary layer briefly loses contact with the car surface, but then quickly reattaches. For a flat plate or a wing or a floor working in ground opaque to work well, you'll have a little local separation, just a little bubble, and then it'll reattach. That's where you get peak performance. From this point, the performance then plateaus as the bubble gets bigger and bigger and a number of vortices appear. But push things too far and one of these vortices will burst causing the boundary layer to detach from the body part. Now, this is where things get interesting. When the vortices burst, there is a sudden reduction in downforce, really not what you want as a driver. And because of this quick decrease in downforce, the car rises up on its spring. And then because the car comes up again, the boundary layer can reattach. So the floor then generates downforce again. And so, the car gets pulled back down once again. And when the car gets pulled back down, the vortices burst again. And so it becomes a cycle of the car getting pulled down and rising back up again, otherwise known as porpoising. And as you might remember, it haunted Mercedes throughout 2022. Now let's take a quick pause here because I need to tell you a little bit more about rolling roads in the wind tunnel. Now, boundary layers don't only form on the floor of the car but also on the track that's underneath the car. On the track, in perfect condition, the air isn't moving. And of course, neither is the ground. But as the F1 car moves over the circuit, the air actually accelerates under the floor. That's the whole point, to generate low pressure and create downforce. But because the air's speeding up, it creates another boundary layer, this time on the ground. So in the end, you get some kind of an airflow sandwich with the ground and the car floor being the bread, the boundary layers of the ground and the car's floor being the cheese and salad, and the free airflow being the meat in the middle. So you're getting a boundary layer built up on the car, but also one built up on the ground. So what do you do in a wind tunnel? So it's really important for engineers to match the wind tunnel's airspeed with the ground speed of the rolling road. So it's as close to the real world as possible. And back in the first decades of wind tunnel testing, teams actually didn't use a rolling road, which caused a load of issues with correlation. We did that in the 1970s and uh, early 80s, but 1970s, you imagine people looking at ground effect cars back then would just take a car to a wind tunnel. What could go wrong? Yeah. And when you design something and put it on the racetrack, it didn't work because you're not getting not only so you, you're having a stationary ground, which is that's what the ground is like when the car's moving. But if you want to get the correct simulation of the car moving over stationary ground, you've got to match the wind and the ground speed. And once the rolling road came in, it was a revolution. And teams realized that to extract the most out of it, they needed to refine its design. And an important way of doing that was with the rolling road surface roughness, because the roughness of the road makes a difference in how the boundary layer is formed. But unfortunately, it can't be exactly the same as the track. This is because the teams are only allowed to use 60% size models in the wind tunnel. Your aim is to get the correlation as close as possible. When you're looking at 0.1% changes or 0.01% changes of performance, which you want to add up, you want to, lots of these marginal gains you want to lump together, then, then yes, you need, you, they, those, that's dramatic. And correlation is very hard to get right because it's influenced by so many things from whether the ground is moving or not, how the tire distorts, and whether the car is turning or sliding. Which is why getting the ground moving, the road surface, and the testing tires right makes such a difference. With matching the ground, it's up to Pirelli to give the teams the data for the macro and microscopic roughness for each track. And teams will usually take the average roughness across the circuit to try and match the correlation. And Pirelli also supplied the tyres for wind tunnel testing, which isn't as good as it used to be for many teams who used to run extra specific tyres made just for certain tests. You go to a competent tyre manufacturer 
and you get tires made so that they will form for you the correct shape in say specific conditions so you might have a set of cornering tires for example so way back 2007 we put a mechanism inside the wheel of the model where you could push the sidewall out to simulate cornering shape but now Pirelli's wind tunnel tyres are more general and as they get a limited amount of tyre sets they have to keep them as functional as possible. And again this is really important for Mercedes problem. To protect the tyres and the road the teams try to manage the friction between the rolling road and the tyres which can be done by either controlling how hard the tyres are pushed into the surface or by adding a smooth Teflon coating on the belt. The idea is to make it smoother and therefore make everything wear out more slowly. Slowly. Still, this doesn't completely get rid of the friction. So over time, the surface and the roughness of the rolling road will wear out. And when the rolling road wears out, it makes a huge difference to the data. A new belt compared to an old belt will have a downforce data offset, a change of up to 1%, which is massive in Formula 1 terms. And this is where Mercedes issue really started. You see, every time there is a rolling road replacement, there needs to be a reference run of the wind tunnel just to fetch data and understand how much that data was offset compared to the old floor in order to recalibrate everything. But the regulations nowadays restrict the amount of time the teams can spend inside the tunnel. Until 2020, all the teams were allowed 65 runs per week. But this value was restricted to a baseline of 40 with the introduction of ATR. That's the aerodynamic testing regulations. But this value changes depending on the pecking order in the championship. Teams would get more or less than the baseline to develop their cars depending on their championship position in order to try and level the playing field. And unfortunately for the development team at this time, Mercedes were champions. And so they only got 36 runs per week in 2021 when they were developing the 2022 car. So they really couldn't afford to spend precious time doing these reference runs frequently and they needed to find a solution to be more efficient. And at the time, that meant running a smooth belt that didn't need to be changed quite as frequently. How do I know? I know because every now and then they would put out old photographs of their model in the wind tunnel. And then I noticed a smooth, shiny belt. And I don't run a smooth, shiny belt. And I might be wrong, they might be right. But we know that their boundary layer will not scale up correctly for, to full scale. For Mercedes, the main advantage was that the belt wouldn't wear as quickly and would give more consistent data, meaning more of the wind tunnel runs were purely focused on performance and not calibration. But the issue was that the smooth belt created a thinner ground boundary layer on the rolling road. And as we know, this was very important when designing a ground effect floor. There was more free flow closer to the model's floor. And so the performance in the wind tunnel didn't correlate all that well to what we saw on track. So it's probable that Mercedes were optimizing for results in the wind tunnel that just didn't work on a real circuit. But Mercedes are pretty quick again. So what happened? Well, Willem believes that they still kept the smooth belt, but temporarily replaced it with a rough belt to fully understand the differences between the two. This way they would know what they would have to account for with the smoother belts, for ground effect cars in particular. They stayed smooth, but I'm confident that they've done tests with a rough floor in order to understand. It's an insight into the delicious complexity of doing, let's say, aerodynamic development where you are limited to running a model uh, or using computational methods which have their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, it's deliciously complicated. And as always, with struggle comes some learning. And if this is correct, Mercedes will never make that mistake again. They're having decided how they're going to do their development, they now are doing their development with more runs than Red Bull. And so I'd say they will be bringing themselves back towards having a really competitive package. And thank you very much to Willem for talking to us. I just made a video about why McLaren are now so fast. If you'd like to watch that, just click up here. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time.